around it in 10 minutes, but um, I guess the, the, good, the good side of that, um, if I put any of you to sleep, you won't have time to start ruling or snoring. But so I'm going to talk about this, uh, this project to map uh, vernal fuel distribution in Vermont. Um, it is an ongoing project, and I'm going to be talking about the work we've done through 2012. Uh, but we do have funding to continue field work for the next couple of years. species that are dependent on vernal pools as species of greatest conservation concern in the state. Uh, and they also explicitly identify the need to map uh, the statewide distribution of vernal pools and really in order to develop conservation strategies that will allow these species to persist over time. So the objectives of this, uh, of this project were to use uh, color infrared aerial photography to remotely map potential pools statewide, and then use <coughs> the core of trained volunteers to help us field verify a proportion of those, uh, those sites. Um, so we used, as I said, hair color infrared aerial photography that was existing in the state wetlands office. This was imagery that was taken uh, in the spring prior to leaf out uh, of 92 and 93, so fairly old imagery. Um, and color infrared is, is excellent to use for picking out water. Water shows up with a really distinct black photo signature, uh, like at the bottom center of this photo, you see a permanent pond. But there are also a bunch of, uh, of vernal pools that you can also see in this, this particular image. And anything red is actively photosynthesizing, so the large red areas are conifer cover. And we used paired stereo images with a stereoscope so we could see topography uh, and see the landscape in three dimensions, which is really helpful to distinguish between seeps and, and vernal pools. Because this type of imagery is not georectified, we had to transfer any uh, sites we picked out on the aerial photos into a GIS. And to do that as accurately as possible, we used a combination of digital ortho photos and topographic maps to pinpoint the location. And there's two basic types of errors associated with this kind of remote mapping. Uh, false positives or type one errors, basically mapping a site that doesn't really exist. Um, usually these are results of shadows from large conifers or other types of wetlands like seeps or uh, skitter runs and things like that that hold water. Um, Type two errors are false negatives, which are just missing pools, and that's most common in those large conifer stands where you can't see through to the forest floor. Uh, for each pool that we mapped, we, we uh, gave each site a confidence rank, just sort of based on our professional judgment, whether it was we had low confidence that it was actually a vernal pool, or up to high confidence, one of five different confidence ranks, which turned out to be helpful uh, later on as we were interpreting the results and doing field work. Uh, we offered 13 training workshops around the state to recruit and train volunteers to help us with, with the uh, field verification work. They were well attended. <clears throat> so there's a lot of public interest in vernal pools. And during the field verification work, each site had, in order to be cons confirmed as a vernal pool, they had to meet certain physical and biological characteristics. In, including having the presence of at least one of six indicator species, which were these, um, if not the adults of these species, at least their eggs or larvae. Um, and fingernail clams, you see an, an asterisk by the fingernail clams, those are only used alone if the 
pool was visited outside of the sort of the spring breeding season. So if sites were field visited in the fall uh, or late in summer when they were dry and you could still find fingernail clams, that was sufficient to, to uh, be considered a vernal pool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this, this was a really important aspect of the project. Uh, I don't, don't want to make, make a light of it, but, but we did have to, uh, because we were assessing wetlands on, on, on private lands, we had to obtain landowner permission. And I don't want to, I don't have time to really go into all that we went through to gain landowner permission, but any pools that were visited on private land had to have landowner permission. We developed this uh, interactive uh, mapping website where uh, we could serve up our, our data layers of potential pools and those that were already visited in the field and also identify uh, the pools that uh, have landowner permission and can be visited if they're, if they're outside of, uh, you know, not located on public lands. Um, and this, this mapping website is, is still available and still active and being updated. And it's been, it's been a really uh, excellent tool to, especially for volunteers, to be able to, you can zoom in on these sites and use different base maps in the background and create maps that you can take in the field. If you click on an individual pool, a pop-up box appears with, with pertinent information about that pool, GPS coordinates, landowner information, that sort of thing. Um, so let's get into the results. Um, so we mapped just over 4,000 potential pools statewide. Those are the green, I mean the gray colored uh, uh, circles, as well as the red, because the red are the ones that were visited in the field that confirmed as vernal pools. We visited about 630 uh, vernal pools uh, in the field, and of those, 54% were confirmed as vernal pools. Um, and we also identified 221 unmapped pools as well. Distribution by uh, biophysical region was, was fairly interesting, um, with just three regions having the high, having very high densities and accounting for more than half of the map pools in our, in our sample. And uh, interesting to note in the Northeast Kingdom how, how the low percentage of pools in that area, primarily due to the, the presence of so much conifer cover, so we just couldn't detect the pools. Uh, just focusing on those field visited pools, just over 600. Um, again, 54% were vernal pools, but if we just focus on those that weren't, the vast majority of them were other types of wetlands, mostly seeps, which we had a, some trouble with distinguishing between seeps and, and uh, vernal pools. Um, while few, relatively few, were actually just shadows from, uh, from conifers or other types of artifacts. Uh, although we did have a few, a few that were kind of interesting. We had this large tire dump <laughs> that showed up pretty nicely in the photos, as well as a few antique cars in one spot that showed up as a showed up as a little cool surprise. Uh, this just illustrates the proportion of field verified pools by that confidence rank that we gave to each pool. And really the take-home message is that and the blue bars represent the confirmed pools. The take-home message is that our high and medium-high pools had a confirmation rate of greater than 75% of the time, so that's pretty good. Um, Putting future field work can really be focused on those two confidence ranks and maybe totally eliminate the low, the pools with a low confidence rank. As expected, these are small wetlands, um, so we had uh, a high percentage of them were um, were very small, 90% less than a quarter of an acre. Uh, also, as expected, uh, our indicator species, wood frog and spotted salamander, were the, were the most common. And I'm going to skip over this because we don't have time. We had excellent volunteer participation. With over 100 volunteers participated in the field, submitted data from over 300 field visits, and contributed a significant chunk of change towards our matching requirement of our state wildlife grant. And uh, just to drive home the point of why this kind of mapping is important, as we were doing this mapping and looking at this old imagery from the early 90s, um, we would often come across a nice looking pool, like this one in the center, and then go to a more updated 
imagery on our, on our computer screens, looking at, say, a black and white ortho photo from the 2000s, and see that that pool is gone, totally developed on top of it. And we saw this quite a few times, especially in uh, sort of resort communities like Stowe and Wilmington, or uh, areas of Vermont. <coughs> Uh, which really drives home the point that you need to know where things are in order to take conservation measures. <coughs> and just acknowledge our funders. This was primarily funded by a state wildlife grant from Fish and Wildlife with a lot of matching funds. Thank you. seeing uh, those pools uh, that were developed, uh, I think, had we realized there were this many, when we first started seeing the first few, we would have kept track of it, but we didn't until later on in the process, so I really don't have a good, a good sense. Yeah, good question, though. Studies trying to predict where vernal pools are using a bunch of variables, including <coughs> things like that, and they've all been total failures, really. Um, so, at, to date, this is still the best method to identify vernal pools remotely. It's really labor intensive, and in the future, I'll be working with the UVM Spatial Analysis Lab to try to use LIDAR as a new technique that would become more automated to predict where vernal pools are, and we'll see how that goes. We have funding from the North Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative to, to do that. Yeah. I was just wondering how you went about recruiting the volunteers that helped you throughout the field season? Uh, we, just, we just sent out uh, notices to, to um, you know, areas of where, where we were gonna offer these training workshops. We tried to scatter them around the state when we were doing the mapping in those regions. And um, we had, at almost every workshop, we had over 100 people. A lot of interest. You know, it was just through, um, you know, local conservation groups, conservation commissions, and a few, uh, a few advertisements in the local papers. Great. 